we need to kind of step back and reconsider this because yeah, you have a lot of traits that are very tough, but overall you have some huge chinks in your armor that are making those few traits that normally would be very helpful, not only not that helpful, but potentially counterproductive, potentially dangerous for yourself. You're listening to the Varg Freeborn Podcast, brought to you by the support from the patrons over on my Patreon page, Violence of Mind. Check that page out. It's only a dollar to join, and there's some benefits that go in there. Every month, I try to do a little piece of something for the patrons. It might be a video recording of me doing a lecture in a class on the weekend or something special that's produced just for them, but there's always something that goes on there. And it's just a buck, folks. So give it a try. Today, we have Mr. Greg Everett from Catalyst Athletics. I have followed Greg for several years and finally got a chance to train with him in Utah last year in August. And it was a phenomenal weekend. I learned a ton about Olympic lifting. That's what he does. His contribution to that world is unmatched by anyone. He has created volumes of work and the content is mostly out there for free. Uh, He's authored the best book on Olympic lifting I think that you could buy. So without any more introduction, I'll jump into this and let you check out this awesome conversation that we had about weightlifting and programming and CrossFit and mental toughness and a new project that he has coming up, which is really cool. Check it out. Let me know what you think. All right, Greg, uh, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for coming on today. Why don't you tell the people a little bit about yourself and your background and what you're about out there on the West Coast? Oh, let's see here. What I'm about is probably a longer discussion than we want to have today, but (laughs) primarily um, I coach the sport of weightlifting, um, and I do that through my team, my company, Catalyst Athletics, which has been around now for coming up on 15 years. we were in California for most of the time. Uh, my wife and I now have been in Central Oregon for the last uh, three and a half years. So we uh, kind of downsized and, and changed direction a little bit. We shut down the the big commercial gym we had been running in California and went back to uh, the garage gym where kind of both of us came from. Our, we were both coached by Mike Bergner in Southern California out of his two-car garage and we always kind of had an affinity for that, uh, that approach to weightlifting. And I really feel like that, that embodies kind of the American spirit when it comes to that sport. And, uh, so we, we kind of tried to steer things back towards our roots and, and get away from the more commercial aspect of the gym. Uh, and that kind of allows us to focus or allows me to focus on, uh, producing content. So, you know, articles and videos and, uh, you know, books and doing the seminars and all these things that I've been doing for the past many years to actually earn a living because the gym is a terrible business, especially when it's the sport of weightlifting in the U.S. Yeah, of course. There's not really much money in that sport. No, you got to be really creative or, you know, work 120 hours a week somehow. In line with mentioning that, there's this huge gap with the performance in international competition between u.s lifters and the rest of the world or certain countries in the world uh what do you think is is the main cause for that gap right now and 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 why does the u.s have to feel like it's so far behind well the good thing is that that's changing it's changed a lot in the past five years in particular um there's a, there's a few different factors and and of course um you know drug use and the, the prevalence and uh <laughs> kind of lack of testing in certain countries um, is certainly one of them, but it's definitely not all of it. Uh, Primarily, it's an issue of, you know, being able to recruit and retain and incentivize the sport for enough athletes, right? So we have in this country, a lot of, um, you know, professional avenues for sport. And, you know, the, the next tier down, of course, is the collegiate level where, you know, these kids can earn scholarships up to a full ride to 
prestigious schools that in, in many cases they would never be able to afford to attend. Um, or in other cases, not even, uh, you know, be qualified for. So it's these, these huge opportunities, um, that can kind of funnel talent that would otherwise be very suitable for the sport of weightlifting into things like football, wrestling, gymnastics, uh, you know, baseball, all these things that, that offer those other avenues. And, you know, the, the old joke that, you know, like coach Jim Schmitz used to say is, you know, well, you can go get your college paid for playing football and, and, uh, you know, maybe become a millionaire and, and get all the, the fast cars and, and, you know, good looking women. But if you choose weightlifting, I can promise you a lifetime of poverty and obscurity. And, uh, unfortunately that's changing. Um, there, there's more and more money coming into the sport in the U S uh, which means that there's more and more opportunities for lifters. There's more opportunities for coaches uh, to be available and willing to help these athletes in this sport rather than try to steer them elsewhere. And so we've been drawing a lot more of this natural talent that had been channeled elsewhere previously, and we're able to retain it long term, you know, so we're getting youth lifters and junior lifters uh, who are, you know, extraordinarily talented, and we're able to keep them for a long enough period of time for them to actually develop into, you know, high quality senior age lifters. Whereas, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you might see these juniors who come out of nowhere who are phenomenal, but they graduate from high school when they go off to college and they're done with weightlifting, you know, things like that, where they, they, they have to come to come to terms with the reality that they can't uh, make a living off the sport. They can't even make a living while doing the sport. So they really have to make some tough choices. So our, our youth and junior lifters now internationally are becoming pretty dominant. I mean, we're as a team, we're winning some of these international meets. We're meddling a lot. Uh, we had multiple senior um, world championships medalists last year. So it's really taken a turn and um, it's made it a lot more competitive, which is good because the more competition there is, you know, that the harder everybody is pushed. And so that level of competition, that level of ability just keeps rising and rising. And then of course that draws more talent to the sport because it gets more attention. So it's, it's really snowballing at this point. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's great news, actually, um, and I, I hope to see more of that, you know, manifesting in the future. If that's the trend that's, you know, been happening in the past five years, hopefully that trend's going to continue, and we'll not only close that gap but push the competition up, like you said, right? Um, and with in that line of thinking, uh, by looking at some of the people who are taking some of the top performing or top uh you know performing athletes rather uh like the other countries and then looking at their methods and like people getting caught up on like oh we need to do chinese method or we need to do this or that and not taking into consideration all of these factors that you know first of all the best athletes are in the united states are incentivized away from weightlifting as right. you said right like so we don't get those whereas these other countries some of these countries and this may or may not be true for all of them or some of them, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that some of them pick their athletes based on genetic predisposition for the methods that they use and their, their gifted athletes uh, that are worked with from very, very young ages in some cases. Um, and we don't have that system. So that method doesn't really, it, to me, it seems like there's more to it than just grabbing that and applying it over here. Uh, I think that there's this uh, big difference about, you know, who's being put in these programs, when they're being put into these programs, how they're being selected, how the program is initiated over the lifespan of an athlete, which can begin at a very, very young age for them. Um, and that that doesn't make that doesn't make it a better system. Is that is that kind of true oh, is it absolutely you know? and it goes further than that too and i think uh people have this this mistake based on um limited information and the skewed perspective they get because of it and so we look at okay well here's the chinese system here's the russian system here's the bulgarian system and you know on and on and uh, we need to mimic that because they're historically better than us well that fails to take into account the fact that the only athletes we see from those countries are the ones who have been successful. We don't see the ones who didn't make it. 
And I assure you, they outnumber the ones who have been successful by orders of magnitude, right? So when you take, you look, so, you know, Bulgaria for a decade or so, a couple decades ago was suddenly just extremely dominant on the world stage in weightlifting. And so, of course, everyone was excited. The Bulgarian system, we all need to use the Bulgarian system. Well, the Bulgarian system at its heart was taking uh, this population of weightlifters that was very large, considering how small the country was, and winnowing it down to 10 lifters, right? So if you start with this giant bunch of people who are all fighting, like literally fighting for, uh, you know, a spot. So they're not having to work in the freaking salt mines or, you know, whatever their other options are, you're going to have the absolute best possible people based on the system that's in place, right? So if you took that same population and you put a different training system in place, you may or may not end up with the same set of people, right? You, that it may uh, kind of skew the results toward a slightly different demographic. You're still going to have people who are very naturally suited for the sport, but they may be ones who are who respond better to that slightly different system, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And so the other issue that we have is is um, the the incentivization is huge, right? If if your options are basically being a incredibly poor, uh, you know, rural farmer who has to scrape by for the next fifty to sixty years, uh, that's your option. Or you can work your ass off with very good assistance from the state uh, in terms of finance and coaching and recovery and you know eating and all these different things. Um, and through that, you can become uh, a national hero and be financially safe for the rest of your life. Take care of your family. And that's not only enticing as an option, but it's a huge driver for that ongoing effort and performance, right? Whereas you know, here it's, again, it's changing a little bit, but it's still for the most part that in order to attain that level in the U S as a weightlifter, you're sacrificing all these things that lifters from other countries gain by becoming weightlifters, right? So it's totally flipped. And so the system thing, the idea forgets to take into account too, that, you know, the system has to be suitable for the individual. And so again, you, if you start with a system and a huge number of people, you can just get rid, you can trim the dead wood, get rid of the ones, call the herd, get rid of the ones who don't work well with that system. But in, in the U S you're working in the opposite direction, right? You have to, uh, you have to change the system to best suit the individuals that you happen to be working with, right? I have to work whoever shows up on my doorstep. I don't get to like walk through the grade school and be like, yeah, uh, you know, Billy, Sally, Sandy, you come with me, you know, your testing was off the chart, your vertical jump is great, you know, you have nice short limbs, uh, you know, I, I basically picked you out of a lineup as as a perfectly suited athlete for this sport, I don't get to do that, I get to, you know, I got an athlete who's in med school at NYU, I've got, you know, lifters who have full-time jobs and have to work around that stuff, and it's it's difficult, so if you think that there is one magical system that works equally well for all these people, you really don't understand how not only this sport, but how sport and training works in general, right? Everybody has somewhat different needs based on circumstances, based on, um, you know, their training background, based on their genetic capabilities, all these different things. And to kind of dismiss all that as being inconsequential and just say, no, there is one true way is, I mean, it's just stupid. I'll say it. It's, you really got to be dumb to think that way. I would agree. I mean, I, I don't have the background in Olympic lifting in particular, but the same thing has been talked about in all these other uh, methods and, you know, bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength training and boxing. They've all went through this, this thing, this international comparison thing, right. uh, especially, especially with boxing and powerlifting, um, the strongman thing has been very international and boxing has been very international. There's been all these different methods and all these different, like, or you got to box like the Irish or, you know, the, and it's, it's the same ridiculousness that, uh, 
you know, it's not based upon individual training, which at the end of the day, we know as coaches, you have to train the individual that's in front of you. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at, look at like Mike Tyson and I'm far from a boxing expert, but I mean, that whole style that custom auto coached was kind of laughed at until Tyson went out there and pretty much tore everybody in half for several yeah. years. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you, if you saw custom auto teaching that to some random guy, you'd be like, ah, it's ridiculous. This is some obsolete, silly stuff. But you know, obviously in that case, it turned out to work extremely well. So yeah, I think it applies to any sport, pretty much any pursuit out there is it has to be individualized with purpose. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing when I'm, when I'm coaching firearms and we've got, you know, the, if I've got 15 people to show up, um, it's, you know, there's not one blanket method that always works for everybody. And, and that's the, segues into my next question for you is that um when you get down to the coaching level and you're talking about cueing right just cues to get a lifter to fix a certain thing or or some part of the lift that you're trying to get them through uh do you believe in individualization of cues or do you try to apply blanket cues to keep uniformity Oh, it's, it's individualized. And so the way I look at it, and I know I've heard you talk about this same kind of stuff. It's, it, the, it has to be principle based, right? Like, so everything you're teaching is based on uh, a set of principles that are universal, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're universal across the activity and across human beings, right? How exactly those principles are applied and interpreted by each individual is what changes, right? So if I have two totally different people, different builds, different experience, whatever, physics still applies to them in the exact same way, right? The, the same thing has to happen to make a barbell go from the floor to over their head. How exactly they do that and how they understand it, more importantly, can be completely different. Um, and so I have to remind people that cues are not they're they're really not um a method of teaching information they're a method of reminding somebody of information you've already taught them right so mm-hmm. you're not trying to teach somebody something necessarily with a one to three word cue you're trying to in the moment make them remember oh yes this means this thing that i learned uh last week you know when when he says uh, you know, whole foot, what that means is I'm, I'm making sure that I'm feeling the pressure against the ground across my entire foot as I drive through the floor in the pole versus, you know, shifting too far back towards the heels, which I had a tendency to do, mm-hmm. right? So that cue, you know, that one in particular, if you understand whole foot, right, you can probably figure it out and you can learn from that. But that's not really adequate to teach that concept. Hmm. And so I had a, a client at our gym years and years ago. He's just a, a funny guy. And, and we were joking about this whole cue thing. And he's like, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really matter what you tell somebody as long as they understand what you're communicating. And so his example was like, as long as you and I agree on it ahead of time, you could say, I love the smell of ripe persimmons in the fall. And I would know that means push through my whole foot. And, you know, yeah. of course it's a silly example, but it's, it's a hundred percent true. It's like, as long as the athlete and the coach understands what a cue is supposed to communicate through that previous education, that's all that matters. But, you know, that's kind of far afield from your original question, as you'll find, I have a habit of, uh, that's you know, enough. But, uh, with the actual instruction and the conceptual understanding that does have to be individualized. And I think on the the more global scale, you look at it as how much information does a particular person need at a given moment and and how much information is is ideal for that person at that moment. In other words, if you're working with an eight year old and you're teaching them day one how to snatch with a you know a broomstick or whatever, you're not going to sit them down and explain newton's laws of motions right? You're going to do something as simple. You're going to, you know, reduce that thing to the simplest ideas possible. Hold this thing with a wide grip and, you know, jump it up overhead. 
right? And you you let that kid through kind of the inherent ability of humans to figure out motor skills, you let them develop that over time. And over time, as they have practice, they get that experience. And with that experience comes a little bit, you know, greater understanding of what's happening and how what they do affects the motion and the results. And then you start layering on that greater and greater detail of information, right? And in the same way, you don't take in a, a 45 year old mechanical engineer who's very, uh, you know, curious and intellectual and just say, just jump the bar overhead because they're not going to be okay with that. They're, they're going to want some level of explanation. So then your, your job is to figure out how can I satisfy this person's intellectual curiosity without overwhelming them with information that's just going to obstruct their progress. So it, it really does have to be individual. And there's lifters, there's advanced lifters that you never talk about, you know, advanced concepts with because for whatever reason, they just don't assimilate that information in a in a useful way, right? They, it, it overwhelms them, they get confused, they start overthinking everything, and then all of a sudden it's it's like they forget how to walk. You know, whereas someone else, that's exactly the kind of stuff they respond to. So that's part of the coach's job, as you said, is figuring out what does this person best respond to? How can I keep, um, you know, evolving my approach individually to get the most out of this guy or gal that I possibly can? Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, I agree with that from having taught people in multiple other disciplines it's the same exact thing yeah uh, sometimes they don't need to hear it and and i can't stand the you know people who teach with one particular way of doing it for everybody and they always try to be as technical technical as they can because some people don't need that i was always as somebody being coached i was always someone that didn't you know i didn't need an anatomy lesson right like if right. i ask for a cue like i say what you know uh head forward or head down or head through like what are we talking about and they're like well you know the <laughs> subscapularis and the infraspinitis and you yeah. know the humor glenohumeral joint is going to internal rotation i'm like wait a minute man i don't fucking yeah. need to know all this okay Let's i'm asking you head forward head through like what are we talking about you know what i mean like so right. some people don't need that and and if you're if you're somebody that's trying to always because we have it in the uh uh, the tactical training and firearms training world too, where you'll go on and they, and they try to f sound very super, you know, scientific and, you know, it's not a fight. It's a dynamic, chaotic environment. Uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and it's like, okay, you know, let's fucking just, it's a fight. Now, how do we manage this yeah. problem? Right? Like, so, uh, but some people, like you say, you get the logical people that, they need that deeper understanding before they can conceptualize it and then visualize it and then they can do it. And I do think that even in those cases, the goal for the coach should be able, should be to reduce these principles and concepts into the simplest versions possible. Right. And I, I, I blanking now, I, I don't remember if it was like Richard Feynman or Einstein or one of these like super genius uh, physicist basically said something like, if you can't explain it to a third grader, you don't understand it. Something along those lines, right? Where you might have this incredible body of knowledge, this incredible depth of knowledge on a subject. But if you can't reduce that to its absolute simplest principles, then you probably don't truly understand it. Uh, you know, everyone gets the, the, the example of the, the, the super genius professor who's a god awful teacher because they can't communicate the information in, in any, you know, meaningful, helpful way to other people who aren't already as smart as they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think, like you said, there's, there's a lot of that because you have people who are insecure in their knowledge, right? They're not actually as confident in what they know or how much they know as, as they're trying to convince you they are. And so they kind of overcompensate with, you know, the, the, the terminology and uh, the, the kind of long winded explanations of everything, because it makes them sound, you know, really intelligent, or at least they believe it does. And, and people who are maybe a, a bit more jaded and cynical, like you and I might look at that and be like, yeah, what are you hiding? Like, what, yeah. what, what are you struggling with here? And in, in that you feel compelled to like, 
turn this into this big deal versus just like, tell me to put my head forward. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, I agree a hundred percent with the whole jaded and cynical thing. I think that describes me quite well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it's, that's, it, it's honestly hard not to be if you're no. in any particular industry that involves instruction for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. You just get to a point where, and I think that's where I think we both have roots that are similar. When you talk about the garage gym, um, I come from a very, uh, very gritty bottom, like, you know, old school type of uh, environment, training environment from my roots too. And it was, uh, it was a mixture of like the bodybuilding and power, power lifting gyms of, um, the early nineties and the, uh, boxing gyms of like the late eighties, the mid eighties in, into the early nineties, uh, that were, you know, they were garages or they were like in some building with like water pipes leaking and <laughs> wires, you know, sticking out of the wall. And, uh, and that was the kind of environment you trained in. Uh, but the type of instruction you got from those places was very, it, it was pared down and all of the bullshit fat was cut away and you just got, it was just, you do the fucking thing, right? Like you, you know, and they had a way of conveying it. That was just, um, I remember my first weightlifting coach, the first time I ever was learning power cleans, it was the bottom of a school gym underneath a stadium, uh, seating in like this old school built in probably the fifties and the, this, dank ass little room in this like moldy basement and and this and this coach was like the scariest toughest guy like he was this gritty old dude that you just imagined eating nails for breakfast and shit right and uh and he's like you know the bar's not close you you know you should feel like a mac truck hit your legs and you know like cues like that you know and you're like you know he's like obviously he wants me to make contact with this bar (laughs) so you're saying (laughs) keep it close (laughs) well and i think though that 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 kind of character both in coaches and in environments is extremely appealing to certain people like you like me right yeah. that's that we we look for that versus like oh gross you know i, I want to go to 24-hour fitness and do the the hollywood workout and just hang out in the sauna and the hot tub and uh, you know i want everything to be chrome uh and you know of course we all learned that lesson with rocky too he got mm-hmm. he got a little too carried away with the fancy stuff he had to go back and get the eye of the tiger from the yeah. the good inner city gym yeah. and, but that's exactly right it's it's <laughs> It's, uh, you know, process base, but also still results oriented, right? Where it's not so much the method itself that we're concerned about. We're only concerned about whatever method produces the best results in the end, right? So that's everyone. The question I usually get with, with doing weightlifting podcasts and stuff like that is like, well, what's your coaching philosophy or what, what system do you use? Like, well, I don't have a system. My, my philosophy works. is, yeah, I use whatever works. And if it's, if that's something that's completely different from one athlete than the other, then I'm going to do it because all I care about is getting the best possible results for each athlete individually, right? Because that's the whole point of coaching as I understand it. <laughs> like what else is there? Mm-hmm. So if you're not willing, you know, it goes back to the original question. If you're not willing to experiment and try something other than, you know, your chosen system, the one true way in all capital letters, then you're, you're completely failing as a coach and you're doing a huge disservice to your athletes. Yes. Yes. And not being able to, to spot that need in an athlete it right. is the like that has to be the problem I, I mean i'm guessing because i don't i don't know but for them not to apply something different to an athlete you have to not be spotting that they need this different thing like it this you know they don't need a thousand block pulls this month right like right <laughs> this is uh you know there's there's a different thing going on with this person it could be anatomically and then how they're you know, how they're put together or, or how they're lifting or whatever the inclination is that's pushing them in this other direction. 
uh, f taking advantage of what direction that they're going in and seeing if something works with that, or do we have to manually change their direction? Because sometimes they're going a certain way because their body's just, that's how it works. And we need to find something that's going to work with them. Um, and then there's systems that, you know, may apply a, a better periodization or a better uh, method of, you know, uh, lift variations that's going to work for that person in particular. Yeah. And, uh, and you can't do that if you're not, if you're not seeing it, if you don't see it in the person, I mean, that, that's correct. Right. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think fundamentally though, that is a, a natural outgrowth of a coach's attitude toward their role. Right. So if you, t if you look at a coach, say from China, um, you're more apt to see like if, if you're not getting the results from an athlete that you want or expect, you're more apt to put the blame on the athlete. Like, well, the athlete can't handle my program or the athlete isn't doing this to allow it to be successful. So it's the athlete's fault. Mm -hmm. Whereas I come from the other side, other perspective is if this athlete is not making the progress that I think they should be, what am I doing wrong and what can I do better? Exactly. You know what I mean? Like I've, I, I have athletes who, you know, I I've worked with them for a long time and, and something will not quite go the way we want. And I'll be just be like, fuck, you know, and, and feeling really bad and guilty. And, and this one athlete in particular one time was just like, you take way too much responsibility for this. Like I'm, I'm in on this too. And I was like, yeah, I get that. And you have to do your part, but I have to do mine. I can't just throw a program out. And, you know, if it doesn't work perfectly, say like, ah, well, it's just her fault because, you know, she went to bed an hour late for the past three nights or, you know, whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's definitely, I've always looked at it more as like, this is primarily my responsibility to figure out what works best and then to get you to buy in and do what you need to do uh, on your end to make it work. And then I pretty much always assume it's my fault if something doesn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big difference. Cause I, I think uh, a lot of coaches and, and I say coaches in weightlifting and in the gym and in CrossFit and any type of training, fitness training, uh, strength and conditioning, and also instructors in firearms and tactical uh, taking responsibility for the failure of, of, you know, students is not something that's real popular. No. And I mean, if, if you're a coach and your athlete or your client or whoever is not getting something and, and your response is like, Oh, well, they just don't understand. Stop and think about what you just said. Yeah. They don't <laughs> understand, but whose job is it to help them understand that is your purpose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if, if they don't understand that, that can't be a rationale for them not being successful. Uh, that should be a, uh, you know, the, the cause for you to reconsider how you're approaching that, you know, problem. And so obviously what I'm doing is not working, so I should probably figure out how to do it better. Yeah. It seems like the, the overarching story is that, you know, if what you're teaching is principle based and those principles are universal and, and you don't violate them, then your approach needs to be individualized for the person that's in front of you. And I think that pretty much sums it up. Yeah. And I think you would agree too, with, with your instruction on various, you know, skills other than weightlifting, if you truly do understand the principles, then new and unfamiliar situations don't totally freak you out and overwhelm you and leave you speechless, right? You even, maybe it's what we call a dome scratcher for a minute while you reconsider, okay, well, how can I communicate this? But you know what the answer to the question is because you understand the principles underpinning the answer. You know what yes. I mean? So it's like, okay, you encounter this thing for the first time. I've never seen anybody do this but I can devise an, a, a solution because I understand the principles. I understand what needs to happen and what's not happening. And so, you know, now the question is how do we communicate that? But you, you, you know, fundamentally what the answer is if you understand the principles first, it's like being a, being a, a professional, you know, medical professional, a doctor versus being a technician. 
right? Well, I yep. can I can run the X-ray machine, but I'm not a radiologist. I can't look at that X-ray and diagnose the problem. And then on a whole nother level, can I diagnose the problem and then prescribe a solution and give a prognosis and all that stuff? I mean, those are three different levels of understanding and ability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent with that. And that's, uh, that's unfortunate that we see so much of that, you know, not being, you know, done properly in coaching and all the various different things from guns to weightlifting to whatever. But, uh, I think being a coach, you know, I've been a trainer of humans in some type of physical thing for, for several years, like, you know, at least 15, somewhere between 15 and 20 years, I've been training people in some capacity or another. Right. Uh, and it's just, you're, you're inclined to do this. And if you have longevity, if you, if you want to have longevity in it, uh, you have to get as good as you can at reading people and understanding what is making that person tick as much as, you know, what's going on with them physically in a, in a given moment and being able to read the person and individualize the approach with the person down to understanding what's going on. You know, when I'm working with my remote uh, fitness clients and my remote training program, I am always looking for, Hey, what's, you know, I don't need the details, but I need to know the general stress level, what's going on in your life. You got any trips going on? You, you know, is there, is, you know, you have some traumatic thing happening at home or something like that, or, right. you know, because I need to know this, if I do programming and my programming fails uh, miserably. Like they go and they're like, they're, they're dying and they're gassing out and they're not hitting any PRs and they're not doing anything good. And I could be like, Oh shit, I'm failing. But then they tell me, you know, that they're, that they're moving and their wife just left them and their car blew up yeah. and they lost their like, And I'm like, okay, well now we fucking understand a little bit better why we're not performing. Makes right. you feel a little better about yourself as a coach. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah. not oh, my hundred percent get that. I, I've, I've had that experience countless times and just been like, Oh my God, do I even know what I'm doing? What's wrong with me? <laughs> and then you find out, yeah, like my entire family was killed last week and you're like, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fuck. yeah. yeah Great 100%. for me. I mean, not good for you, but yeah. Yeah. So that's the individualizing is, you know, reading people and being that coach's eye goes farther than just looking at movements. You got to really see what's happening with, with your subject, you know, your, your athlete or whoever your trainee is and, and really get a finger on like, what's, what's really going on with this person. So I can approach this in a way that, you know, is going to work with what's happening. Um, and that's just the art of it, I think. Right. Um, so kind of shifting off that a little bit, uh, but uh, along the same kind of track, uh, for the average person who is not, who wants to do some weightlifting, but they're also doing either a sport or they're in CrossFit, which is very common, right? Weightlifting and CrossFit have kind of, they go, they go hand in hand in some weird way in today's world. And, uh, yep. if somebody's doing those things, uh, how do you approach programming for them so that they have this this Metcon component and they have this CrossFit component, uh, but they can also have some kind of maybe some linear progression with weightlifting progress uh, at the same time? How how do you approach that? It, my, the the basic template in in my mind is that you you always start with the strength, right? So you have kind of the the skeleton of a program as always the weightlifting or the strength training. And then everything else is kind of uh, built around that. And that may change slightly as you get closer to a competition that is not strength-based. But by and large, that's what you're doing. So uh, the, the key really is, again, that individualized assessment is, what is this person's weaknesses? What do we need to bring up? What are these, this person's strengths that we can exploit and then maybe de-emphasize a bit um, to, to kind of free up uh, capacity to train those weaknesses. And so in that way, you're determining, all right, well, I have the skeleton of strength, but you know, how much of our total possible training volume, how much of our energy and time is going to go into strength versus go into, um, 
the various aspects of conditioning or the various uh uh, skill training they need to do, right? Because with something like CrossFit, there is a, a, an array of skills, right? You know, walking on your hands mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever it may be, you might have someone who's a very strong, very well-conditioned athlete, but you can't walk on your hands and suddenly you get to the CrossFit games or regionals or whatever they're doing now. And there's a, you know, hundred yard hands walking uh, in an event, well, all of a sudden you're disqualified. Like uh, mm-hmm. all of that capacity is meaningless. If you suddenly have that one chink in your armor <laughs> that you happen to get boned on because just by chance, that's the event they chose. So it, it definitely takes that, that assessment at the beginning and then ongoing assessments, you know, pretty frequently. Um, so again, paring down that strength, a lot. So you, you have to get really creative. If, if it's someone who is pretty strong already, but they're really poorly conditioned, obviously you've got to emphasize the conditioning stuff. Um, and you can't do both a hundred percent effort, hundred percent volume, no matter how many people have tried to convince themselves it's possible. It just doesn't work. You know, I get these questions like, Oh, can I combine your program with this program and then also do this program? Like, yeah, you can, <laughs> It, you're going to probably end up in the hospital. Yeah. You know, it's not going to do you any good. So why don't you figure out like which of each that you actually need and then create a hybrid versus just layering this more and more shit on. Um, and I think that's another huge skill in coaching is learning what, what you absolutely need, what you want and what you can do without. And then the next level of that is, becoming really good at uh, kind of multi-dimensional programming is how many of the different characteristics that we need to work on can we squeeze out of, you know, one thing versus like we have to do, can we do one thing instead of three different things to accomplish the same goal? Um, And with, you know, weightlifting stuff, an example of that would be a complex. That's straightforward, but even a single exercise, you know, if we have, someone who's got a a really weak back, we have to do some kind of pulling, but rather than doing regular snatch pulls, um, plus, you know, RDLs, plus weighted back extensions, uh, if we have really limited time and capacity, um, perhaps because we're also doing CrossFit or something else, uh, maybe we do something like uh, a, a segment snatch pull where they have to, you know, pause for three seconds right when they break the bar off the floor you know pause below the knee pause at mid thigh Mm -hmm. and so they're they're getting that same pulling work at the top but then they're also getting all kinds of additional you know postural strengthening work that we wouldn't be getting otherwise and in that way you just took you know three exercises and and combined them into one and suddenly now you've have this extra time and capacity to go work on your middle distance running or you know whatever it is you you need more work on uh, and need to find the time for and that it can be a struggle for sure and it's you don't always get it right the first time or several times but you just kind of keep experimenting and chipping away until you get to a, a product that is best functional for that person Yes, I I 100% agree with that. I think that, uh, you know, it's interesting to listen to someone like you talk about it, you know, in terms of multidimensional programming and things like that. And looking at going back to what you said at the beginning, that putting strength first, um, I don't, I'm not quite sure what you, where you're going with that one, but I, I take that approach myself. And an example would be, uh, a girl that I just encountered versus a guy that I've been working with for six months. So this girl comes up to me uh, the other day last week and she's like 110 pounds and she's looking to put on, she wants to be 125, 130, a stout, strong girl and look good and be strong and yeah. which is totally doable. And it's a hundred percent doable. She's a uh, 110 pounds, 30% body fat. And so I'm not her coach. Her coach has her on running a calorie deficit and doing CrossFit four days a week, which is going to pare her down to nothing. Uh, and then you're going to try to build on that, you know, and, and that's, I mean, that, that approach might work. I, I took 
I've taken an, an, an opposite approach with other people that's been very successful. And for example, I've got a kid who came to me six months ago, 153 pounds. He was, he was very vulnerable feeling and wanted to be stronger, wanted to be bigger. He, he was afraid he was going to get his ass kicked by any homeless person that, you know, came out of the alley. So, right. so I said, okay, so we'll straighten this out. The first thing we need to do is get you strong, build a good, strong foundation, a good, strong chassis. Then if you want to go do jujitsu or you want to do boxing or you want to do uh, conditioning work, we can take you as a strong human and condition you and then you're going to you're going to trim down to what you're going to end up with being strong and conditioned yeah. and and that's what we started with and in 6 months he went from 153 now he's hovering around 190 and we just started his conditioning work cuz he's starting to touch uh the 300 club with his squats and deadlifts so it's a good time to shift him over to um conditioning and now I've got him doing some metcons and and you know some some heavy conditioning work and now he's becoming a machine like he's strong yeah. he's bigger and he's got an engine now that he can go for a little while and i think that approach really works well by putting the strength first and getting you a, a good strong foundation then we can do things with it is that approach that you think is is viable yeah absolutely and it's funny uh my good friend michael rutherford who has been a strength coach for years out in uh, who lives out in kansas uh super stud older athlete too but he always made the joke like these people get so wrapped up in in doing the conditioning work, uh, you know, kind of first and doing everything else after is like, well, y y you can't have strength endurance if you don't have the strength part. Right. And, and so, like you said, you build that chassis, you have that strong frame, that foundation, um, and then you have the strength that is the underpinning of strength endurance so it's like okay yeah you're gonna get in a fight with the next homeless guy who jumps out of the alley uh but that's not gonna be uh like a two-hour marathon of <laughs> slap fighting right you're it's gonna be demanding on strength endurance right you you have to have the strength uh you know for that kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat but you have to be able to sustain it potentially over a pretty long period of time, like a surprisingly long period of time in some yes. cases. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, you, I, I don't, I agree with you. You have to approach it in that direction. It doesn't work the other direction. You don't start by being able to, uh, you know, do sprints on the, on the stationary bike and then get stronger from that and maintain that conditioning, do the opposite. Yeah. And I, I do think, you know, people will say like, Hey, I, you know, I'm doing, I'm a CrossFitter, but my biggest weakness is strength. Should I quit CrossFit for like six months and just focus on strength? And almost always I'll tell them, no, don't quit doing the conditioning work, but you just need to pare it way down shift and you need to design it in a way that it's not interfering with the strength work. And so usually what I'll tell them, the obvious thing is like, you know, don't do the super crazy heavy leg conditioning stuff don't sit there and do a workout if you're a crossfitter with you know 400 wall balls and thrusters and and that kind of stuff where you're just blowing your legs out mm -hmm. so that they cannot recover and and be prepared enough for the strength training that you're trying to to, to emphasize it's like there's so much shit you can do that doesn't interfere with that you know throw in more of the monostructural stuff rowing cycling ski erg you know running any of that stuff um you know mixed in with you know the the pull ups or upper body stuff or limited lower body stuff and use things that are um you know more more rounds more number of exercises and lower reps per exercise and round so that you're getting this huge demand on the heart and lungs because you can basically continue going nonstop because you're not being limited by local muscular endurance mm. or that stamina. Um, and then you're also not completely thrashing some part of your body that you really need for this thing that you're trying to emphasize. So it, it, you, you can do everything at one time. You just can't do it all as much as everything else which is the clumsiest way I could have put that, but you yeah, know what I'm saying? No, it made sense. <laughs> it made sense. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the one thing I would add to that, and I would say, I'm interested to see if you agree with this is that, cause I, I feel very strongly about this point I'm about to make. All right. Better the, agree then. <laughs> the, the, the practicality of be, 
building a strong foundation first is is really found the benefit is really found in uh injury prevention and preparation for these other uh demands that you're going to put on your body and what i mean by that is a properly administered strength program will take into consideration the conditioning and building of the connective tissues and the musculature around the joints so that they can handle those loads like i never throw my um my athletes or my trainees into one or at maxes in the first four four to six months at all right like it's yeah. repping up building up that in that that toughness and that density building up the connective tissues everything around those small musculature around the joints Everything has to be brought up to a, a standard that and you you get this stronger chassis completely, not just your big muscles, but everything's ready for these loads. And this is a big problem I see with guys in my field, which is more of the self-defense and tactical stuff where they're going from the couch and into jujitsu because jujitsu is telling them that that's a good idea. And then they're getting shoulder surgeries within six months because their fucking joints are not ready for these massive loads that are being put on them in these impossible angles that are designed to rip the joint and some white belt goes a little too hard on them. And the next thing you know, now they've got $35,000 surgery and it's like, what did you expect your your body you did nothing to prepare your body for this load that you're going to put on it and now you have went and got yourself hurt and it's the same thing with weightlifting or crossfit or anything like that if you're going to compete in the games or the open or you're going to put these you know multi uh planar loads on your body where you're going in all these different directions doing all this crazy shit you you need to build a good strong foundation and get that body ready for that because it, it's going to help you not get yourself hurt so easily later on down yeah, the road. Absolutely. And I think people really do underestimate the importance of that. And everybody's in a big damn hurry to go do the fancy stuff. They all want to do their muscle ups. They all want to do, go get their blue belt and, and you know, mm-hmm. all, all these things, they don't have the patience and they don't have the foresight at age seven to start with the perfect GPP program that's going to prepare them for what they choose to do at age 35. Uh, and the, the, the thing is, is with that strength, um, yeah, you, you are strengthening all those components. The, the connective tissue is huge. And like you said, all those little stabilizing muscles around the joints and mm-hmm. the adjacent joints uh, it, it is so huge. But in addition to that, I think what you gain from it is a much better sense of what you are and are not capable of at any given time, right? So you you take that guy who jumps straight into jujitsu after doing, you know, the only thing he's ever wrestled with is the cellophane wrapper on a fucking moon pie. Uh, and you you throw him into that situation with the white belt who, yeah, Hey, we're going to go 70% and he's going 170 because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have an off switch and he has, there's no gradient, right? It's either go or stop. Um, But you, you put a guy in that situation and they, they tend to very much overestimate the durability of their own bodies. Mm. Right. Because if you have, you don't have that athletic background, you've never been in a position where you're like, Oh, I just blew my shoulder out or, Oh, my elbow's facing the wrong direction. Um, or, or even just kind of flirted with those things. You don't know where that red line is. Mm -mm. Right. I'm very familiar with what I can and cannot do at this point in my life. I've had the, the whole range of injuries from the very minor to the full blown surgical six anchors to reattach my freaking arm after it exploded off, you know, out of my shoulder. Um, and so, but you learn that with the experience of training Mm -hmm. and, but you have to gain that experience. Like you said, in a very intelligent, progressive manner versus like, all right, day one, let's go test your, uh, your, your max back squat. So we know where we're going. Oh, well now I just hurt my back day one. So now we can't go anywhere. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, knowing what you can do at any given point helps you keep going on that with that forward progress over a longer period of time. And that of course allows you better and better self-awareness and all those things. So it's, it's a definitely um, a snowball effect where you, you, you gain all those traits uh, physically and, and mentally 
to be, continuously come better and better versus like this weird sporadic, uh, you know, two steps forward, one step backward, or in some cases, five steps backward. Cause you know, you, you got yeah. your, your bell rung or your, your arm ripped off or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. A hundred percent. And so I think it's, uh, basically it's, you know, you need this, you need this preparation. It helps you to prepare for these things. It lowers your risk of injury and it prepares you to better handle these loads. It also prepares your body awareness and your sense of where the red lines are, where those danger points are at. Right. Uh, and you learn that through training and you can learn it in a way through training that doesn't, you know, tear yourself off. Now, when, you know, in some of the cases where you've gotten hurt or other, other athletes get hurt at the, we, we understand that at, at the elite level, or if you're trying to even aspire to the elite level, um, that's not, that's not synonymous with healthy lifestyle. So no, <laughs> there's no, there's no misconception there that if you're pursuing an elite performance in uh, a physical task is set like CrossFit or Olympic weightlifting or you know, fighting, um, it, it power lifting, there's nothing healthy about that lifestyle. Um, no, but it should be a calculated risk, right? Yes. And it should be not just calculated like, Oh, this is incredibly risky for very little potential return. It should be calculated and considered. Is this worth it? Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, am I going to go jump in and spar with, uh, a, a world-class boxer, three weight classes, you know, over me because I want to get some in the ring experience. No, mm. you probably shouldn't do that. Right. <laughs> that That's, that, you're going to get your freaking teeth knocked out and add to your list of concussions from all the other dumb shit you've probably done in your life. Um, and it's not going to really teach you anything other than that you make bad choices. Uh, and you know, the experience too, you not only learn to kind of, to feel what you can and can't do at any given time, but you learn strategies to kind of mitigate your weaknesses, right? How do you work around that stuff? How do you avoid getting yourself into what you know are particularly vulnerable positions for yourself? Uh, you know what I mean? Like, so mm -hmm. if you are a guy going into jits and you're like, ah, I got a history of shoulder dislocations or subluxes or, you know, whatever, you're probably going to be very cognizant at all times of the common ways that someone's going to tie you up and put you in a position to crank on your shoulder, mm -hmm. right? You're going to, you're going to put more of your time and effort into defensive strategies for that thing. Just like I have these weird, very natural defensive strategies to avoid, you know, cranking on that shoulder or these jacked up elbows and, and uh, you know, things like that, or, you know, I've got a history of bad ankle sprains here. So I do these weird things when I come off, you know, landing from a, a jump to, you know, make sure my base is extremely solid and things like that, that I wouldn't normally do without that experience and that knowledge that, Hey, if I'm not careful, I'm going to really fuck myself up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I agree hundred percent with that. I think that you develop those things naturally. I've got some issues with the uh, lower back injury. And I also had at one time uh, a rib dislocated from my vertebrae in my back at around T4 left side. Uh, and it was very dysfunctional for a long time, meaning it would, it was a loose socket. It would pop in and out. So I developed very naturally these, these ways that, you know, when I'd put pressure on myself and whether it was in wrestling or uh, with lifting weights or anything like that, like I would, brace in certain ways or you know just very i'm just very cognizant of that area and my um uh, my tensioning and my bracing and all of that changed in in ways that was specifically designed to protect that and i right. think it's natural you just develop that yeah absolutely and it, you know it, like like you know very well there are things like that that you cannot it's not an academic thing no. like you can't learn that uh as theory it really has to come from practical experience like yes. you, you can sit there and explain that to me and i can understand it conceptually but that doesn't mean i'm capable of applying that mm -mm. no but if your rib pops out you will be i guarantee that <laughs> oh yeah 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 when you when you 
when you hear the sound of like trying to break a still green tree branch yes. inside your head <laughs> and then your whole arm is numb and you look down and it's hanging like four inches low. Yeah. You, you learn, <laughs> I don't want to do that again. What, what can I do to avoid this experience? I'm good with one. Yeah. Yeah. And that stuff is terrible, man. It's, you know, and, and that's the kind of things that I really, as coaches, you know, as a coach, I try to take it really, really serious to try to avoid letting my athletes ever experience that at the extrees. Oh, absolutely. Um, and in doing so, it's like taking, I, I tend to take the longer road in strength development so that we do build that, that musculature and those connective tissues and, and that body awareness. So all of those come up at the same time and yep. we get our, you know, we get our, our people on board with understanding what their bodies are capable of and not capable of doing. And then, um, then that's, I think as, as a coach, we've done our job to like, okay, now if you go hurt yourself, it's because you're, you're fucking trying to, you know, do the maximum amount that you can absolutely do. And if that's, if that juice is worth the squeeze for you, then by all means go for it. But beyond this point, you know, is the risk exponentially rises, right? Right. Exactly. And, you know, I guess we're, I'm just repeating myself at this point, but the, those risk versus reward calculations need to be sincere. Like you really have to do it. Uh, if you expect to stay in anything physical long-term. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I got something for you here. I want to know, we had this conversation, you and I, where I came out to Utah and was in your seminar in Utah and spent the weekend out there with you in August of last year. And we went out and had a few beers and had this talk about this project you're working on. And I was super intrigued by this because it's right up my alley. And it's something that I think is right up your alley as well. And it's this glad you whole... like it because I'm going to be asking you for an endorsement quote sometime in the unspecified <laughs> near future. But go on. <laughs> yes, yes. The uh, the the subject of mental toughness, right? And this is uh, this is like ninety percent of what I deal with in my subject matter. And uh, you are working on a pretty you know unique angle on this, and I think that you've got a, a really good background for it, and also the way that you approach. Uh, coaching and, and approach things in life, I think that uh, this is going to be some very fruitful work coming from you. So tell me a little bit more about that and, and what direction you want to go with that. Yeah, so uh, it, it is, I've been kind of knocking the idea around in my head for for years at this point um, of this new book that was not weightlifting related. It was, you know, this nonfiction project that... Uh, you know, it takes me a while sometimes to decide, yes, I actually want to do this. And then beyond that, yes, I'm actually capable of doing this in the way that I want to see it done. Right. Um, and I think actually having that conversation with you out in lovely Utah hmm. at what it would Chili's or whatever it yeah. was, yeah. the only place we could buy beer, beer yeah. uh, one place. uh, really actually kind of helped push me over the edge, uh, because one of the things that we talked about um, kind of helped that this one final piece fall into place. I'll see if I, re I remember to come back to that in a minute. But anyway, the, the book is um, essentially uh, an attempt to kind of redefine and very clearly define what being tr tough truly is. Uh, because that word, I think, is is very unclear. Uh, there's a lot of connotations and associations that I think are unfair and inaccurate. Um, you know, the, the obvious example is that being tough is this masculine quality, inherently masculine. And so, like, for a woman to per pursue toughness is this a weird thing or a women can't really be tough or, Oh, they can only be tough emotionally and not physically or yeah, they can, they can stand the pain of childbirth, but you know, they, they couldn't withstand combat or, you know, whatever yeah, we come up sense. with, you know, with this the kind of conventional thinking. And so it's, it's breaking down. Obviously this is all my opinion. Um, what exactly toughness is. And, and so I ended up breaking it down into, to, basically four essential traits. Um, 
you've got capacity, which is, you know, what can you do? Uh, you have, or excuse me, capability, what you can do. Capacity is what can you withstand. Commitment, what are you willing to do? Because uh, those first two things are pretty meaningless if you're not actually willing to apply those abilities, you know, in situations that actually count. And then finally is character. And that is who are you and are you secure in that identity? And that, that was the one I was really struggling to articulate. And, uh, you know, you and I talked about that and I kind of was bringing up and trying to, I was trying to explain to you what in the fuck I was talking about. And you're, you basically, I forget exactly what you said, but I was like, Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to say. (laughs) And so that, that really fell into place. And I think that was the last, uh, that the last kind of thing I was waiting for to, to be able to say, okay, yeah, now I've kind of got the formula. I I have a little roadmap of where I want to go with this. And so it's, really trying to again break this idea of toughness away from all just the silly like social media and and traditional media horseshit that goes along with it um and provide both kind of the the again the principles the conceptual underpinnings of the whole thing but then steer that into practical steps that anybody can take to achieve, you know, greater and greater toughness progressively over time. Um, and it, it, it's probably going to really make some people happy and probably it's going to not necessarily sit as well with other folks, because I think it's going to kind of, uh, take a little air out of their sails with, with certain things. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that I can explain it well enough that those people, won't see it that way you know what i mean like they'll get okay i haven't thought about it that way this makes sense this is fair. It's not like no actually you're not tough you're just a douchebag i'm not i'm not trying to make that point with anybody necessarily it's it's more like we need to kind of step back and reconsider this because yeah you have a lot of traits that are very tough but overall you have some huge chinks in your armor that are making those few traits that normally would be very helpful not only not that helpful, but potentially counterproductive, potentially dangerous for yourself, right? And, you know, something like, and I'm sure you're very aware of this with what you do, but, you know, silly things like not having an accurate accurate, uh, self-evaluation of your abilities at any given moment, right? Mm. And, you know, with the self-defense part of things that is really easy to do these days i think oh yes right? the classic example is you know you sit around watching boxing and mma uh you know every weekend for 10 years and so it's it's very easy to make that seem like this intimate familiarity with fighting but then you know if you've never actually been in any kind of fight uh, especially a street fight where there's no referee ready to jump in. If someone decides that they have no fucking boundaries Mm -hmm. um, and and don't, don't buy abide by your sense of fairness or, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. it is. And, you know, you get your teeth knocked down your throat. It's a really, we want to try to avoid that method of kind of retuning your self-perception right we want to be able to to do that before we get in that situation uh in order to be prepared as well as possible for a situation like that right so now at this point i think i'm just rambling so no no. i have to steer me in a clearer direction no i i that that made total sense and i think uh if, if I remember correctly, the primary thing that we boiled down to talking about in Utah was the character aspect. And um, I think that there's uh, definitely probably of, of those four categories, the character aspect is where the most lacking. Um, oh, yeah. It is Absolutely. like it, that's where the biggest deficits are probably found. And one of the things that I try to push in my teaching is that uh things like self-control and compassion are as much a part of toughness as uh, the willingness to beat somebody to death or shoot somebody, right? Like they're as much a part of toughness, mental toughness in particular um, that uh, people are missing that. And that's where you get some of the misguided masculinity that is a little bit, 
too much aggression, too much. Um, I got to be ready to shoot somebody in the face and, you know, bust somebody <laughs> up and like, right. And it's like, uh, settle down killer. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, you know, it, it, here's the thing. Like I, I, I want to be a well-rounded person so that if I'm out and I need to be a savage and I have been a savage on other human beings full blast. And I know exactly what that feels like and what that blood tastes like. So when I say this, I mean it in that sense from experience that if I have to be savage on someone, I can have that on tap, but I can be completely in the moment and compassionate to uh, if I'm out with a girl or my daughters, or, you know, I can be uh, a loving, caring person that's attentive to them and, and in the moment with whatever the, the event is going on, but savage is on tap, right? So if you, yeah. if you need this guy, he's going to show up. There's no, I, I don't need to show him to you all the time. Cause he's fucking sitting in the little room in the back of my head, just waiting to be called up. So yeah, we're not worried yeah. about that part. Right. Well, you, you nailed it right there. And you said, I don't need to show him all yes. the time. And that, that's the key is, is I look at it and, and being tough and acting tough are mutually exclusive, right? You either are tough or you act tough. Uh, if you, because if you are truly tough, like in, like you're talking about, like I'm talking about, you don't feel compelled to prove it to people all the time. Yeah. Right. It is, like you said, it is that part of you. It's that tool waiting in the toolbox that is going to get taken out and fully implemented as needed, but never any other time. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you're not out there picking fights to, to, you know, measure dicks and, and to reassure yourself. Right. I think that that's really the primary issue is that insecurity of, of, you know, am I actually confident in my capabilities? Um, and, And if you are, you don't have to keep going out and proving it, especially to other people, right. You're not looking for recognition or validation. Um, you don't need, the world's validation if you are confident and you, if you are secure and you are truly prepared and all those things, it, it doesn't mean that you don't ever talk about it or you don't discuss it. And, you know, we don't sit here like this and, and talk about how we do it better. Mm-hmm. It just means that we don't have that, that, that need to show everybody else that this is what we're up to. Right. And I, you made that, that point well and, and repeatedly in the violence of mind book and, and with the idea of concealment is, Mm -hmm. and I look at that as, as two parts, right. Is, is concealment of who you are and, and what you're truly capable of is in, at least in part, an intentional strategic decision, right. Because that is in your benefit to not have everybody around you know exactly what you are capable of. Um, Yes. And then the the other part of it is that you just don't feel the need to communicate that to people, right? Mm -hmm. You're not desperately like tugging on people's pant legs saying, hey, look, 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 I can beat the shit out of this guy. Like, okay, well, when it, when it comes up, you can, we'll all know. And I think that that's one thing that, that some people will probably not like being told, like, it sounds like they're being lectured on it, which is not at all my intention, of course. Um, and it's, it's maybe like a little hard to swallow. Like, well, I don't know. I kind of, I want people to know I'm tough, but I think that, and I would assume that you would agree with this is that if you really are tough, um, in this way that we're talking about, you are communicating that quite clearly to people without saying a damn word and without any ridiculous affectation and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, wearing a t-shirt that advertises what you're up to or, or, you know, speaking a certain way, like there, there is an air about someone who possesses that kind of ability and the resulting confidence that is very hard to miss. You know what I mean? Yes, I agree a hundred percent. And you're going to, you're going to convey that, through your actions and your confidence and the confidence with how you move. And it doesn't have to be arrogant or it doesn't have to be like an overblown false confidence that it's, you know, that's projected confidence. Like you just move confidently, you know, and um, it's, and that's, that's conveys that like, that's, 
in the animal sense, like when we're, especially when we're dealing with criminal level violence, like it's very animalistic at, at that level. And there are um, at the predatory level uh, for humans is very big on picking up on cues in terms of physical capability, awareness level, like how do you move? How, how confident do you look physically in your own skin? That kind of stuff. If you're awkward and, and you don't look very confident in your movements and you don't look very confident about what you're doing and how you're feeling in the environment that you're at, it's, it's picked up on by a predator. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so it's very, it's very much based on those things. So if you have those things, you can't help but convey it. Like it's, you're not going to look like an awkward, scared person because yeah. you're not right. Yeah. And like you said, it doesn't have to be anything overt. And to go back to what you said earlier about that self-control being paramount, it's you, you're communicating your abilities and that toughness with the absence of action in a lot of cases too. Right. And, mm-hmm. and I, you, I've heard you talk about this on your podcast and in your book, and it's knowing how and when to not react Yes. That is just as important as knowing how and when to react, right? And and I think that that's just like a, a an entirely higher order of capability, um, you know, on an intellectual level, and a, a, a really on a kind of a second nature sort of level. At eventually, ideally, is that you recognize instantly: is this something that I actually have to respond to, um, or is this something that I know I don't have to be concerned with, or I don't have to actually take any action because I know that if something occurs, I'm prepared and I will, you know, like you said, that little guy in the, in the back of your head that you're, <laughs> you're holding back yeah, yeah. is ready and willing to, and likely quite eager mm-hmm. to pop out and, and join the fun. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I try to help guys to reach that point where they can compartmentalize that a little bit to be, uh, it's not like you're closing a section of yourself off. It's more like you're becoming a more complete human on the outside. Absolutely. Uh, and and it's really just integrating these things that you're, you know, I, I think what's happening with guys like that is they're projecting this, this overblown confidence out and toughness out because they're protecting their, uh, their, their vulnerable soft spots. Right. Oh, and, absolutely. And uh, I think I, I personally feel like an exhibition of true strength is having those uh, vulnerabilities, you know, out in the, in the open, but having the teeth to back them up. Right. Right. Well, and uh, I getting into all that kind of stuff with the book and, you know, emotion and, and like you said, compassion, empathy, empathy, and all these things that for whatever reason, um, so many people have decided just have no place in someone who is tough. And it's, it's, it's not that they have no place. It's that they are things like anything else in your life that you have to know how to control and how to use. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and having these, these capabilities uh, and the self-awareness to be able to pull out the right tools at the right time and leave alone the ones that you are not appropriate to use at any given moment. Um, and th- something else I know you've talked about, and, and this is a big point of the book too, is people kind of lose sight of the purpose of this kind of shit, right? Is why, why am I bothering to do all this mental and physical preparation um, to be tough or, you know, whatever you want to call it uh, for what you're doing. And it's, ultimately it's so you can be at peace and actually enjoy your life right so you don't have to go through your life being scared and anxious and and worried about what's coming around the corner worried about what's going to happen to you or your loved ones or or whoever you're responsible for and that kind of thing and uh i I think that is really key because once you lose sight of that it's very easy to start going down the wrong path and getting consumed with uh the 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 traits themselves versus Mm -hmm. what their purpose is ultimately like why am i bothering to do this and it's so we can be freaking fulfilled and content and at peace not living on edge you know like a a caged animal who's just getting poked the whole time yeah yeah and get 
That's, that's so correct. And I know that you've, you've seen me talk about that in different formats, but the, the biggest thing for me is, especially in the tactical world, as much as I hate that word, um, that that industry is built upon the, the small collection of students who seeking that constant validation of being this, you know, this tough, like prepared person. And, and my argument is that with this certain part of this population, you see them no matter what time of the day they're on the social media arguing about trigger types and tactics and, you know, stipplings on their gun. And, uh, and it's like 24, three and three AM, 3 PM, 9 AM. It doesn't <laughs> fucking matter. They're there and they're yeah. talking about the same shit. And you're like, bro, who's taking care of your family? Cause yeah. it's, you're fucking not. Cause you're not, you're on social media talking about triggers. Like no, <laughs> like someone else is playing with your wife's hair. <laughs> it's yeah. not you. You know, and that's buy the, the trigger and fucking move on. <laughs> yeah. Go shoot the fucking thing and stop talking. Like, uh, yeah. and, and that's the thing is like, you know, when we get to this position where we, we are seeking this constant, you know, involvement in that, uh, whether it's the outward projection of it or the constant validation of I'm a part of this, I'm a part of the tough guy crowd. Um, then we're missing the whole picture of why we started to do it or why. And you have to ask yourself if you're asking yourself this honestly and your answer is because i want the world to think me a tough guy then by all means continue on on your path but yeah. if, if you really do want to have peace and you want to protect your family like many people say or you know i want to uh, uh live a more peaceful long healthy life with my family in one piece and everybody gets there together then you have to live that life you can't yep leave that go because now you're all wrapped up in this you know this tough guy thing and then you're and then what the they come home and they're like you know telling their wives like you need to get a gun and then learn how to shoot too because there's bad guys everywhere and they're gonna fucking get you and rape you and kill you and cut the kid's head off in front of you and if you if you don't do this we're gonna be like fucking weak and you know you're you're gonna be vulnerable and now the wife is fucking stressed out she hates yeah. this thing that you're doing and and you could call on that one guy yeah you know but i see this happen and like i have what because you know they drag these wives to my class and they're and and they're like and you can tell they've been dragged there and you're, they, they don't really want to be there and so i try my best and i'll out it a little bit and i'll say listen you know if you came here on your own accord because you really thought this was important enough to learn, that's great. But if you didn't, you're here. So let's try to make something out of it. Uh, right. That's going to be good for you because, you know, I, I see what's going on here, you know? So, yeah. but that kind of thing is, you know, it's that thing we're talking about where there's some kind of disconnect between understanding why I'm doing it and how I'm doing it and who I really am, what my character is yeah. and, it between the action, the actual action that's happening. Yeah. And that, that's why, like you said, that character aspect is so critical and, and really is fundamental to the whole thing is it, if you don't know who you are, you cannot make decisions. Part of knowing who you are is, you know, what are your values? Like what, what is meaningful and worthwhile to you in life? And if you don't truly know those things, you can't possibly make decisions every single day that align with your character, right? It's, you know, and, and I think that's, that's true for everybody, you know, want to be tough guys or not is we, we tend to have this idea in our minds of who we are yet that is not really being manifested with our decisions. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the, the way I look at it is, is your identity is an idea or is, is, uh, you know, described by ideas, but it's defined by actions. And so if, if the actions don't align with the idea, then that's not who you are. That's who you think you are. Uh, and that kind of self-deception is, you know, for one thing, it's responsible for a lot of discontent in the world, but the other thing it's dangerous right? It goes back to believing you are capable of things that you may not be and therefore getting yourself into situations where you are way more vulnerable than you think you are. 
Um, and I don't, I don't mean that just from like a physical violence point of mm. view either. I just mean that in general, there's so many mm. things that we end up finding ourselves in these, in these positions where had we been aware of who we are and how our actions reflect that we would have avoided them in the first damn place. Absolutely. And you know, one of my, one of the core teachings of my concealment um, curriculum is you become very manipulatable when your story that you're telling yourself is evident. It, it's right. It, you like when you're, when that story that you're telling yourself in your head about who you are is uh, transparent, it's so easy to psychologically position you because yeah. you, you, your actions are not the same as the story you're telling yourself about who you are and what kind of actions you think you're taking. And when someone can see that, especially at the, uh, you know, at the person who, at the, the person who has ill intent, whether it's physical or psychological or, you know, whatever it is, they can sense that and they can see that and they will use that. Um, and, right. and it's one of the things that I teach about when you're going to fight, if you have to fight someone, like I'm trying to figure out the story that this guy's telling himself in his head, you know, in, in, in the negotiation or the verbal confrontation part, because if I can manipulate that during that time, we might not have to fight. Um, and, you know, if I can go along with, you know, it, and support his story in some way and, and in the conflict, maybe that's the tact I'll go. And on the other end of it, you know, somebody who, um, is like going to drop some, uh, uh, drug in your drink so they can get their Rolex, Rolex off of your wrist is going to tell is going to make you believe all the shit that you believe in your head is, you, you know, and, and get you in a position where they can uh, manipulate you and take something from you. So yeah. that's, that's a hundred percent like part of that. And I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest mistakes people make is, is they forget that self-deception isn't deceiving anybody else, Mm-mm. right? Like you said, it, it is typically very transparent to everyone around you, even if you are convinced of, of what you're telling yourself. And that, again, that makes you incredibly vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And so until you can become aware enough to align your character, your values, or your identity, your values, and and your your behavior, and, and I say actions a lot, but I, I you know I mean your way of thinking along with your actual physical actions, right? Mm-hmm. Because that that completely colors the way that you perceive the world around you and where you fit in and and how you react to everybody around you, and like you said, you could react to someone in a certain situation and end up in this violent confrontation. But if you have the awareness and the self-control to figure out what's going on, maybe like you said, you avoid it in, in, you know, and now neither one of you ends up in prison and or dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, yeah, there's a lot going on and, and hopefully, hopefully I can get all those ideas into writing in a way that makes sense and actually resonates with people instead of just making a, a 80,000 words of me talking to myself. Yeah. So on that note, um, what, how, what can we expect from your book and how, when do you think you're going to be getting this out to the public? Great question. <laughs> My agent is as we speak, shopping it to publishers. Um, so he, he's shopping the proposal around. I'm busy actually trying to finish writing the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so as far as a timeline goes, I I don't know. I really hope within a year that the thing's actually out there and in print Um, because I, I mean, I can, I can write pretty quickly. Um, so that I'm, I'm less concerned about the timeline there. I'm more concerned about the timeline of getting a, getting a publishing contract because I don't, I really don't want to publish it through my own company. I don't want to deal with it. Um, I really want to pass this off to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Um, in the meantime, though, I'm, I'm putting together a website and, and some social media stuff where I'll, I'll be putting out related content, um, both leading into the book's release and, you know, after the book's release. So 
that you can find and and I'm almost embarrassed to say the names out loud, but it's just what worked out. It's becomingtough.com, uh, which as we speak is not quite done, but it will be very soon, like within the next week or so. Um, and then on Instagram, it's just at becoming tough is the username. So again, I'll, I'll be putting out content on that stuff much sooner than the actual book uh, is out and available to get into your hands. Okay. All right. I'm actually shocked that you got becoming tough.com. I mean, that's, I, I am too. <laughs> that's, I mean, it's, it's good. Like it works. So I looked at uh what the first one I looked at was like, I think I looked on Instagram first was like tough book. And it turns out that's just a laptop brand. I'm like, Oh, fuck, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. That's not going to work. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, so I think we've went at it for a long time. We covered a lot of stuff. Um, it was pretty damn awesome. I think yeah, I wonder um, if anyone's still listening. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, my crowd, the 12 people to listen to me are pretty hardcore. So, well, <laughs> <laughs> so we still got 10 or 11 hanging on till the bitter end. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I it, it was a great conversation. I, I was looking forward to this one, honestly. <laughs> Yeah. So where, uh, where can people find you, uh, with your weightlifting, your, your products? Cause I'll say this, uh, you know, Greg has put out the largest library of free content and for information on weightlifting that I think the world's ever going to see honestly, and it's all free. And I don't even know why the guy did it. Uh, but it's, it's, you did a phenomenal job, man. And it's just the most, I've been following your work for years and it's just an unending stream of content that comes out of you. And I just don't know where it all comes from, but it's just phenomenal quality. It's very good information. And when it comes to weightlifting, it's just very to the point and, and very informative. So where can people find out more about you and what you do and your products, your books, things like that? Uh, you can find everything at catalystathletics.com. Um, that's kind of the, the portal to all things I do. Uh, and then, uh, Instagram, if you, if you want social media specifically, Instagram is at catalyst athletics. And that's, uh, that's where I put all my social media effort. Um, I do have YouTube and, and Twitter and Facebook, but Facebook at this point seems kind of dead. And, uh, at least for, for my industry. Um, so Instagram is where all my effort goes. Cool. All right. All right. Well, thanks for coming on and I really appreciate it. It's always great when we get together and talk, man. I really enjoy it. Yep. Looking forward to the next time.